A warm welcome to this video. This is the second video in the series where we're looking at fever and the nature of the febrile response. And fever is sometimes called pyrexia. Now, in the last video, we looked at the physiological changes that generate fever and how fever is important and how fever is stimulating immunological processes. And in this video, we're going to carry on that theme, but we're going to look at the evidence for it from the literature. Now, if you don't want to watch this video, if you want to skip to the bottom line, I'll give it to you now. When someone has a viral or a bacterial infection, the natural response to that is fever and has been so for hundreds of millions of years in vertebrates, we believe. And it happens across a wide variety of animals as well. So fever is this natural response. Now, there's two reasons for this. One is that viruses and bacteria like 37 degrees centigrade best, which is our normal body temperature now, 37 degrees centigrade. And when the body warms the temperature up in a fever to 38, 39 or 40 degrees centigrade, the viruses don't like that and they don't reproduce as well and the bacteria don't like that and they don't reproduce as well. So it inhibits the reproduction of these infecting organisms. So that's good. But as well as that, when the body temperature is at 37 degrees centigrade, the immune system is working, of course, but it's just sort of rumbling along. It's working at a, a lowish level. But then when we increase the temperature, when the patient is febrile, then the immune system works more actively. And we looked at a couple of very specific examples this, of this in the last video, where we looked at increased activity in interferons, which fight viral infections, and where we looked at increased migratory rates in neutrophils, which are specialised white blood cells that help to fight bacterial infections. So, we realise that fever is helping the body to get rid of the infection. Now, two things follow from this. One is that if we artificially lower the fever, we're going to allow these organisms to reproduce more prolifically and in greater numbers. And that's going to increase the severity of the infection. That's, in other words, it's going to increase the morbidity. The person will be ill for longer. And as well as that, the second point is it increases the likelihood of complications. And the complications of infections can be damage to various organs or complications ultimately in infection can result in death. So this video is going to talk about basically people 12 year old, uh, 12 year olds and older. We're talking primarily about adults. Although I will be doing another video on children as well. But we're talking primarily about older um, teenagers and adults in this video. And we're going to see that if someone has a fever, that's a natural response. And to lower the fever, usually, not always, but usually, is not the right thing to do. It's going to work against the body's own natural defence mechanisms. So for most people, for adults like me, who are otherwise re reasonably healthy... If we get a fever at home, it's better not to artificially reduce that fever because we'll get better more naturally, more quickly and hopefully more completely if we allow the fever to run its course. So that's the bottom line of this video. You can switch off now if you want. Otherwise, you can stay tuned and watch the evidence I'm going to present here. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is, is causal versus symptomatic treatment. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, when we treat someone who's unwell, or indeed who's been traumatised, we can either treat the underlying cause of the condition, or we can treat the symptoms. So, for example, if someone has diarrhoea, perhaps caused by an amoebic infection in the colon, then we could either give drugs to kill that amoeba, that would be a causal treatment, or we could give drugs to stop the diarrhoea. We could virtually paralyse the wall of the colon and stop the diarrhoea that way. It would give opiates. Opiates would do that, for example. But of course, the whole point the person has diarrhoea is to get rid of that which they don't want. That's which, that, that which the body wants to get rid of. Now, let's suppose this pen top here is something incredibly dirty, something absolutely filthy. And it's in my hand like that. 
I could say, ah, something filthy in my hand here. I know what I'll do. I'll keep it. Well, you could say, oh, I'll get rid of that. And you could wash your hand. So diarrhea is doing that. It's getting rid of it and it's washing your hand. It's a natural defense mechanism. So in the case of infective diarrhea, it's usually a bad idea to stop it. And it's the same, for example, if you had a viral uh, gastritis. The vomiting is to get the viruses out of the body. It's the natural defense mechanism. So we can give drugs to stop the vomiting. They're called antiemetics. But they're working against the body's natural defense mechanism. We're treating the cause. We want to treat the cause, not the symptom of the disease. So suppose you came to me and you had a great big horrible splinter sticking in your finger. And you said, this hurts. My, my finger hurts. I've got a great big splinter in it. I could say, oh, you've got pain. OK, in that case, I'll give you intravenous diamorphine and that will take the pain away. Or I could say, oh, you've got pain. Well, in that case, I'll give you codeine, ibuprofen and paracetamol. And that will help with the pain. I, I could obviously do that. Or I could say, oh, that, that's a painful looking splinter. I tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll give you a nerve block in your arm and stop, stop it from hurting. Or I could give you a local anaesthetic around about the splinter. I could do all those things. But you can see they're only treating the symptoms. Doesn't it make much more sense to take out the splinter to treat the cause rather than to treat the symptoms? So that's the idea of a, of a, of a causal versus a symptomatic treatment. Whenever we can, we want to treat the underlying cause and then the symptom, which is often the body's response to the underlying cause, will simply go away on its own. That's what we should be doing whenever we can as a general principle. So we see these examples here and uh, antipyretic drugs. Now, anti, of course, is against py 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 pyretic. Pi is heat. So a pyrexia. A pyrexia is the same thing as a fever. It means the body is hot. So an antipyretic drug will take away the fever. So if the body temperature is 39 degrees centigrade and you give an antipyretic drug, that can bring the body temperature back down to a normal 37 or so degrees centigrade. That's what that drug will do. It is antipyretic. Now, examples of these, uh, the common ones are paracetamol. We call it paracetamol in the UK sometimes called Panadol. That is acetaminophen in the United States. So uh, it's also called uh, Tylenol in the United States. And this reduces fever. So it's antipyretic, but it's not anti-inflammatory. So it's not anti-inflammatory. So, uh, so paracetamol or acetaminophen is analgesic. It's a painkiller, but it doesn't reduce pain by reducing inflammation. It works on central parts in the brain and the spinal cord to reduce pain. But it also works on the hypothalamus, which is the thermoregulatory centre of the body to reduce temperature. And it does so very effectively. So if you've got a fever, suppose your temperature is 39 and you take paracetamol, about 20 minutes after taking the paracetamol or the acetaminophen, exactly the same thing, then what happens is you actually feel really hot because you vasodilate and the hot blood goes to the surface of your body and you feel really hot and your temperature comes back down again because it's anti it's antipyretic it reduces the temperature so that's one group of drugs that will do this and then there's a second group of drugs that will do this um, and there's only these are the only two groups i can think of actually that do this um, the the other second group is what we call the, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs n s a i d s non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs now these are drugs which are anti-inflammatory but they're not steroids so there's, there's other drugs which are anti-inflammatory called steroids, but that's not these. So they are not steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Aspirin, of course, everyone's heard of. Ibuprofen, naproxen. And th th these are other trade names for ibuprofen, which is the most common one. So we looked in the last video that the whole point of a fever is to increase the immune efficiency of the body, to increase immune function. So someone with a fever, their immune system will be working better than someone without a fever. And also the environment for the organisms will be much less pleasant. So low grade fever, <coughs> um, US values here in Fahrenheit, the rest of the world, <laughs> sorry, the rest of the world uses centigrade. Centigrade is a much more logical, much more scientific scale. But anyway, it's where we're at.
So um, low grade fever, yeah, we'd normally say a fever is above 37.8 probably. Um, that's probably what I would count as a, as a fever or a pyrex, so above 37.8. But here we're saying a low grade fever is 38.1 to 39 degrees centigrade, which is 100.5 to 102.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Moderate fever, which is uh, 39.1 to 40 degrees centigrade. And this is what we commonly see, actually. That's 102.2 to 104. So when, when some comes, someone comes into work with, a, like, an A&E department with an infection, very often their temperature will be about 39.5 occasionally you see a temperature that's 40 degrees centigrade not not that often in the last year or two the highest i've seen is about 40.5 degrees centigrade then a high fever is 41.1 40.1 to 41.1 which is 104.1 to 106 that would be a high fever and a, a very high fever hyperpyrexia would be uh, above 41 degrees centigrade or above 106 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Now people are always asking me <clears throat> when, when I suggest that it's often not best to treat fevers people are always saying well when will a fever start doing damage? When is it going to be harm harmful? And there's no fixed answer to that but the answer is probably somewhere above that. But the, the, the question actually is somewhat academic because people who have a viral or bacterial infection Usually the, the body, because this is a natural response of the body to try and combat the infection, normally the temperature of the body does not go up to levels where it would cause damage. Normally the fever is self-limiting. It's just that people tend to see fever as abnormal and want to treat the symptoms. When in actual fact, what you need to do is treat the underlying cause of the disease. And it's quite amazing how many people don't really seem to understand this. Fever is seen as the enemy. Fever is seen as abnormal, but it's not. Now, I've actually done a, a, an informal survey on junior doctors over the past few years at work, and uh, I've asked about half a dozen of them, at what temperature does the body's immune system work best? And of course, the answer is at, at febrile temperatures. It's working best up, up here. This kind of range is when the immune system's probably working best. And... Uh, I must say, none of these junior doctors knew the answer to that question, so I was really quite disappointed by that. So it, it's amongst even medical people and amongst the general public, it's seen that fever is bad and should be treated and eradicated at all cost. People don't seem to realise that it's promoting the immune function of the body. So um, here we have some clips I've taken from journals. National Review of Immunology, a, a well-known prestigious medical journal. One degrees centigrade rise in body temperature requires a 10 to 12.5% increase in metabolic rate. Now, what this is saying is for every degree centigrade your body turns your temperature up, that is a very expensive process in terms of oxygen used and food reserves used. And the body wouldn't do that unless it's got a good reason to do so. The body doesn't waste food resources. So that information on its own is enough to indicate there is an advantage to having a fever. Uh, there is mounting evidence that the, uh, that the increase of 1 to 4 degrees centigrade, that's, that's what you get in fever. So if 37 is normal, then 38, 39, so, sorry, 38, 39, 40, up to 41 would, would, would be fever. It's, it's between 1 and 4 degrees centigrade increase in body temperature. Doesn't sound like much, but that actually takes an awful lot of energy to do that. Um, this is this increase in core temperature, the, the, the temperature in the core, in the middle of your body, is associated with improvement in survival and resolution of many infections, right? So more survival, in other words, less death, and more resolution. The infection gets better without complications and reduces the risk of sequelae. Now, antipyuretic drug studies have shown... To, now, th th this was done in uh, people with uh, influenza infection. So antipyuretic drugs in viral influenza infection to diminish fever correlates with a 5% increase in mortality. So if you give drugs... If, so if someone's got influenza and you give them antipyuretic drugs, that increases their chances of death by 5%. 
So that's really quite a profound statement. So in influenza, if you reduce the fever, you increase mortality by 5% if you take away the fever with acetaminophen, paracetamol, or ibuprofen or something like that. And you get the same effect in animal studies. So in rabbits infected with this rabbit virus of some sort, which I'm not familiar with, um, that actually increases the mortality when fever was inhibited. So what they have found was when they took away the fever in rabbits by giving uh, antipyretic drugs, when they took away the fever, 70% of the rabbits died. When they let the fever run its course, only 16% of the rabbits died. So clear evidence that fever is helping the rabbits to survive. Sepsis or neurological injuries, whereas treatments that induce hypothermia can have a, a clinical benefit. Right, so what this is saying is that sometimes when patients are septic, which would mean they're very ill in hospital with very severe infections, or when they have neurological injuries, this paper is suggesting that reducing the fever can be appropriate. So this is not talking about people with routine viral infections at home. This is talking about critically ill patients in hospital or people with brain or spinal cord injuries. And of course, if there's brain or spinal cord injuries, that's not an infectious condition. That's another type of condition altogether. So sometimes it's necessary to treat fever, but in the vast majority of cases, it's not because of this evidence here. But if you if you were septic, uh, that's got a very high mortality, so you'd be treated in hospital, and clever doctors would be making that decision anyway. So antipyretics used to in inhibit uh, fever target multiple aspects of inflammation response beside temperature regulation. Right. So what this is saying is that when the body has an infection, that causes different inflammatory reactions, and inflammation is the body fighting the infection. So antipyretics, particularly the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are going to inhibit inflammation as well as fever, other aspects of the inflammatory response. So in other words, what this is saying is that giving um, ibuprofen, for example, can have other adverse effects in infection uh, other than reducing the temperature. And of course, I should have said this at the start, but it goes without saying that ibuprofen paracetamol, aminosinophen, uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol have no antibacterial properties whatsoever and no antiviral properties whatsoever. Absolutely none. They are symptomatic treatments. More evidence. Critical Care Medicine 2017. Fever boosts several aspects of innate and adaptive immunity. So innate immunity works against a wide variety of potential infecting organisms. Adaptive immunity is specific to a particular virus, a specific virus or a specific bacteria. Um, the fever inhibits microorganism growth. So it slows down the rate at which bacteria can divide. Slows viral replication. So the viruses don't multiply as quickly. And augments, that means make better, antibiotic therapy. So critical care medicine here is clearly saying that fever boosts immunity. Critical care medicine 2009, fever is a normal adaptive response to infection and its suppression is potentially harmful. Febrile temperatures result in more rapid neutrophil migration and secretion of antibacterial chemicals. Now we looked at this in detail in the last video. The neutrophils were these white blood cells, the polymorphonucleosites that migrate towards bacteria and uh, can kill them. And uh, they also can secrete antibacterial chemicals. So these can move towards, they're the bacteria over there, this can move there much quicker at febrile temperatures. Again, if we inhibit the fever, they would move more slowly again. Actions of interferon enhanced at febrile temperatures. So interferons are antiviral chemicals released by virally infected cells that help to inhibit viral replication in adjacent cells. They interfere with viral replication. So um, interferons are good and uh, interferons work better at febrile temperatures. They're enhanced at febrile temperatures. Um, association be between a rising body temperature and decrease in mortality and morbidity during infections. So in other words, if you 
if the body temperature goes up the mortality that is death and the morbidity that is disease goes down that's what that means so if the body temperature goes up so if that's temperature there so if the body temperature is going up like that then mortality and morbidity are going down like that very simple statement there a rise in body temperature and a decrease it results in a decrease in mortality and morbidity during infection and that's true whether it's with viral or bacterial infections it's probable that the use of antipyuretic anti-inflammatory analgesic drugs so the analgesic drugs here that it's referring to are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like diclofenac or ibuprofen when they lead to suppression of fever results in increased morbidity and mortality during most infections in other words they're saying they're much the same thing really so lower the fever increase morbidity increase mortality in most infections whether it's viral or bacterial infections in animal, animal models artificially raising core temperature leads to an improved survival and lower infection burden Lower infection burden means you can culture less viruses and bacteria because you've raised the body temperature. Despite the potential benefits in uh, fever in patients with sepsis, treatment with antipyuretics is common. So sepsis, I know, I know I've said that sometimes you need to lower temperature in sepsis. Sepsis is a bit complicated. It's more of a hospital treatment, really. We're not talking about a, 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 an intercurrent infection you would treat at home here. Um, so in hospital... Uh, we still commonly give antipyuretic therapies. And I'm always challenging people on this. I say, is acetaminophen or is paracetamol antiviral? Is it antibacterial? No. At what temperature does the immune system work best? You know, it just doesn't bear up to any simple um, interrogation. But people are so used to the idea that fever is bad. When fever is not bad, fever is protective. It is an adaptive response. Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, 2010. The risk of mortality, death, was increased by antipyuretics used in influenza-infected animals with a fixed effect pooled odds ratio of 1.34. And this, this says the 95% sure that it was between that and that. Now, anything over one here represents the percentage of the increase in risk. So if it's 1.34, that equals a 34% increase in risk. And the risk here is of increased, what does it say? This is the risk of mortality. Yeah, the risk of mortality, that's right. I mean, this is serious stuff. Mortality means death. That's where we get the word mortuary from. So these animals were 34% more likely to die. Evidence from animals and human challenges studies have suggested that antipyuretic therapy may actually prolong the duration of the illness. Now that makes sense that it would prolong the duration of the illness because you're allowing the bugs to carry on reproducing. Suppresses humoral immunity. Now humoral immunity hum is, is the antibodies. Humor are the liquids of the bodies that the... the um, the humor is, is the liquid. So humoral antibodies are those which are in the plasma and in the body tissues, in, in the tissue fluids. Uh, response and increases the level and duration of viral shedding. In other words, this is saying, this is saying that um, if you lower the temperature, then people are ill for longer. The illness does not resolve as quickly because you've reduced the efficiency of the immune system. And it's also saying they are infectious for longer because they will carry on shedding viruses for longer. And again, this makes sense because if you allow the immune system to eradicate the virus, the virus is no longer in the body. So you can't be coughing the virus up or diarrheaing the virus out or whatever it is um, because it's been killed. So this is actually saying that antipyuretic therapy, anti antipyuretic therapy to a lower body temperature can actually make people more infectious in viral illnesses lung another prestigious journal 2017 
Our findings suggest that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may worsen the course of community-acquired pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is, is infection in the tissues of the lung, right down in the alveoli of the lung. So non-steroidals may worsen the course of community-acquired pneumonia with delayed therapy and a higher rate of pleuropulmonary. Now, pleuropulmonary. So pleuro is the, the pleural membranes around about the lungs. And if these become infected, we get pleurisy. And that causes a sharp pain on breathing. Sharp, people say it's like being stabbed in the ribs with a knife every time you breathe. And pulmonary means to do with the lungs. So more likely to get complications in the pleural membrane surrounding the lungs and within the lungs themselves. In community acquired pneumonia, that's some pneumonia you catch at home, basically, if you give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. British Medical Journal. Ibuprofen rather than paracetamol does not help control symptoms in patients with acute respiratory tract infection and must be balanced against the progression of symptoms during the next month. Right. So what, what, what this trial did was it looked at paracetamol and ibuprofen. And it's basically saying that there's no advantage to giving ibuprofen. But giving it, when, when people were given ibuprofen, they were more likely to carry on complaining of symptoms uh, for a month after the illness. A minority of patients carried on complaining of symptoms. So that will mean, if anything, it's better to give paracetamol. But as we've looked at, it's probably better to give uh, neither for most intercurrent infections at home. Journal of Infectious Diseases, 1990, aspirin and paracetamol suppress antibody response. These are the immune proteins, the immunoglobulins that the body makes naturally. Now, th there are times when we do need to um, suppress fever. Th th this does happen. So for every one degree centigrade rise in temperature, metabolic rate rises by 10%. Now that means that the respiratory rate has to go up because the body needs more oxygen. And it also means the heart rate has to go up. Now, for otherwise healthy people to increase the respiratory rate or to increase the heart rate doesn't matter too much as long as they don't have lung disease or heart disease. But for people with lung or heart disease who can't respond to this, whose organs are too damaged to respond to this, then sometimes doctors will decide to reduce fever. But this is not talking about healthy people. This is talking about people with uh, lung disease and uh, significant heart disease. Because fever is going to increase oxygen consumption and can and adversely affect cardiac function in people with compromised cardiac function. And of course, the other big thing, I probably should have said this near the start as well, but when people come into hospital and the temperature is 37 and I think they've got an infection, then I can't tell what the infection is because fever is such a useful clinical feature so if someone has no fever i have to say did you take aspirin or ibuprofen or paracetamol or acetaminophen in the last four or five hours and if they did that means that the observation of temperature is pretty well useless to me because i don't know whether they should have a pyrexial temperature or not because the drug has inhibited it now um hospital out of hospital cardiac arrest and uh, acute brain injury now, I haven't treated anyone with acute brain injury for a while, but very often um, to lower body temperature greatly increases the prognosis. And I think here yeah, you often need to lower the body temperature quite a bit. I, I'm not, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. Now, out of hospital cardiac arrest, we used to lower their body temperature quite a lot. But now, as long as the body temperature is not above 36, um, the, the, the prognosis is greatly improved after out of hospital cardiac arrest. So um, th these are conditions where um, keeping the body temperature low or even with acute brain injury, I believe giving hypothermic therapy can be an advantage. But these aren't infections. These are other conditions that can alter temperature, but they're not infections. And then just to re reiterate the bit, I did stay at the start. Uh, this is from Medline Plus, the US National Library of Medicine. Brain damage from a fever generally will not occur unless the fever is more than 42 degrees centigrade. Untreated fevers caused by infections will seldom go over 105 degrees Fahrenheit, 40.6. And this is, this is very much my experience. Very, very rarely have I seen a fever above 40, uh, 
40.6 very 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 rarely so um and i've seen quite a lot of fevers so um so th this question is when do i need to treat a fever is you the answer to that usually is well your body's thought of that before and it won't make it too hot for you anyway but the answer here would certainly be that a fever of uh of uh, 41 degrees centigrade is is okay 105 or 40.6 is an acceptable pyrexia and uh, according to what we've just looked at and according to my opinion there will be no need to reduce that because it's enhancing the immunological response of the body of course if you treat fever the patient will feel better almost straight away and they'll think you're so clever for prescribing these drugs that make them feel better but you'll actually be making them sick for longer and increasing their probability of complications sequelae and indeed mortality and mortality means you go to the morgue